So thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, saying what is cybersecurity and why is it important for all of us to be cyber aware? So broadly speaking, cybersecurity refers to a body of technologies, uh, processes and practices, which help us to protect our networks, our devices, our data programs, uh, software, uh, all the hardware on which this data runs, our software runs. Uh, essentially to protect all of these things from uh, damage from attack, basically from unauthorized access. Computer uh, cybersecurity also, you know, is referred to by other names such as information technology security, information security, computer security, and stuff like that. So generally, people tend to use these names quite interchangeably in the sense that uh, information security, cyber security, computer security, data security, all of these tend to be used kind of interchangeably. Uh, at a broad level, they all mean the same thing. Uh, if you go deeper, there may be some nuanced uh, uh, differences, but for the purpose of today's talk, we can kind of assume that they all kind of mean broadly the same thing. Now, today's talk is saying, uh, if you ignore cybersecurity, it's disastrous. And so before I go deeper, I just want to make uh, sure that people understand what's the uh, purpose of today's talk, right? So what happens if you ignore cybersecurity? I mean, what kind of risks are you bringing upon yourselves? Now, obviously, there's some risks are more serious compared to others, but broadly, to just to give you some examples, so if you are not bothered about cybersecurity, then very likely the device that you are using, whether it's your mobile, it's your tablet, it's your desktop, it's your laptop, whatever computing device that you are using, and associated devices like your you know, thumb drive, USB drive, stuff like that, or if you are using the cloud, then any and all of these systems, for example, could be exposed to malware attacks. So you could become victim of a ransomware attack or the malware may erase your data, lock you out of your system. Another important aspect could be the fact that somebody may steal into your system and steal your confidential data, right? Now this data could be the list of your most, uh, most uh, profitable customers. It could be related to your patent. It could be related to some intellectual property that you are developing. It could, for example, in the pharmaceutical industry, it could be, for example, composition of a very well-selling drug or a chemical or a, a, a composition, right? Uh, the other aspect could be, for example, people can break into your system and alter the data, right? So for example, my bank account has 10,000 rupees as my balance and somebody changed that data to 100 rupees. Right? Obviously, I would be very upset with the bank because they are not having cyber security. They don't have proper cyber security, right? So these are, for example, important aspects. Uh, on the other hand, unwittingly, you may be allowing hackers and attackers to use your computer to attack other computer systems, maybe your competitor computer systems. In such cases, you cannot fail ignorance of cybersecurity because the law says you have to be protective of your systems. You, you should not allow your systems to be used for these unlawful activities, right? And probably as an individual, the most hurting would be if your credit card information is stolen and then people make unauthorized purchases uh, on those credit cards. In such cases, the banks don't take uh, owners of responsibility and you kind of end up paying for it. Uh, so the bank typically says, you know, for example, in India, it's very common we get the OTP. You are not supposed to share this OTP with others, right? But if you do that, 
And if a fraud happens, then uh, the bank will say, hey, sorry, it's your fault, right? You've got to pay up. So these are some of the potential risks. There are many more. I've just given you a kind of teaser into what could potentially happen. Of course, the, the sobering thing that we have to keep in mind is that the state of our industry is such that the concept of total security or absolute security does not exist. It's, it's relative, right? And so as organizations, as individuals, we only have limited resources, whether it's in terms of money that I can spend on improving my service cybersecurity, whether it's in terms of people that I can hire, in terms of space, uh, logistics, etc. So, so what we have to do is we got to prioritize and we got to make sure that we protect our most important assets uh, from being attacked through cybersecurity issues. So the rest of my talk is going to talk about, is going to dwell into some of these issues. And hopefully by the end, I'll be able to give you a better appreciation of why cybersecurity is important. So as I said, at the university, we have a dedicated center that deals only with cybersecurity. So we, we take a 360 degree view of cybersecurity. The first quadrant we look at is in terms of information security and assurance. So we want to understand what is security, what is data security, whether it's a college cyber or information security. And then also to understand that security is not a snapshot in time. Cyber security posture, your risk profile, your risk appetite keeps changing. It's not a one-off thing. So for example, if, if you delete some uh, obsolete hardware, you add some new hardware, maybe you have upgraded your software, you have installed a new version, you have applied a patch, uh, existing employees left the company, new employees joined the company, you've now connected to a particular cloud, you have connected to some other organization through networking. Now, all of these kind of changes, the, the landscape, if I may say, there is a lot of churn. It's never constant. It's never static. It's always dynamic, right? But in all of this churn, you've got to make sure that the security posture, your risk profile, your risk appetite stays within your, uh, the range that you are comfortable with as an individual and as an entity, as an organization. So we explore uh, all the concepts involved in this. The next aspect is to say, hey, as I just mentioned, there is a sober recognition that there's nothing like absolute security. And it's also not if I will be attacked, it's more a question of when will I be a victim of cyber attack, right? And so how do I prepare myself? What kind of cyber resilience uh, can I put into place? How can I practice myself when a cyber incident happens? Right? If I get hacked, I, I don't want to wake up and say, hey, now what should I do? Whom should I call? Where can I get help? Is my data safe? Right? I don't want to be in that situation. So <clears throat> I want to practice incident response. I want to do tabletop exercises. I want to you know, understand the concepts of blue team, red team, purple team, those kind of things. I also want to build in business continuity best practices. What kind of data recovery do I have? Disaster recovery do I have? Right, I have my data backup, but can I restore from my backup, right? A lot of us believe, yeah, backup is important and we all do lots of backups, but very few of us actually test whether the backup, can I restore from that backup, right? The next aspect uh, is digital forensics and digital evidences. People have already talked about it, right? Uh, so, <laughs> what is digital forensics? Uh, how do you collect and preserve digital evidences? How do you write a report that could be acceptable for a court of law? You know, all of those kind of things. More than that, from an engineering perspective, you also want to understand, hey, am I doing the right locking? Am I auditing my locks? Just by looking at your locks, for example, you, it could give you a lot of information about the state of your cybersecurity. The final aspect, of course, is, is the uh, aspects of cyber law, right? Uh, how cyber law has some similarities to current laws, in what ways it's different uh, in terms of understanding, implementation, et cetera, interpretation, right? And so we want to expose people to understand all of these things. 
So we, we work uh, uh, in number of air aspects. Uh, again, we, we cover the entire uh, gamut of the industry, right from network security, software, cryptography, blockchain, IoT security, uh, cyber physical systems, industry 4.0, and of course, mobile systems, right? So if anyone wants to reach out, I, these are my contacts. Now, what we've been doing in the last three, four years is we we offer about 23 different courses in cybersecurity, right? This is quite interesting because a lot of people think cybersecurity is one subject, but uh, we go quite deep. And so we offer a lot of specialized courses, both at, at various levels, MTech, PhD, uh, of course, bachelors, et cetera. We are 18 faculty strong. We touch about 2000 students through this program, right? Uh, we do a lot of projects. We also have a lot of uh, industry certifications. I have a couple of SAN certifications. Uh, my colleagues have Network Security Plus, CC Council, et cetera. Right. And so let me come back to the core of my talk today. So why is cybersecurity so important? I mean, as everybody said, the core of this is around data. It doesn't really matter whether the data is in your hard disk, in your desktop, in your laptop, on your mobile, in your tablet, in your wearable, right? It doesn't matter. The question is this data, right? And today, if you look at the economy, whether it's in India or globally, there's, there's a digital transformation that's happening, right? And this digital transformation is driven by cloud-first, mobile-first strategy, right? Which means that today, when you start a new company, if you want to do a software development, you don't buy one laptop and you install all your software, set up your local data center. You just choose a cloud provider and you start working with the cloud. Second, there is a absolute recognition that most people in the world will access the internet through their mobile phones. So you got to make sure that your online presence can be accessed through the mobile phone and the <clears throat> user experience on the mobile phone has to be equally or if not better uh, than compared to a desktop device. So this digital transformation is what is driving our growth, right? As of January of this year, uh, the, the International Telecommunication Unit estimates that there are about 4.6 billion people uh, uh, using the internet. And probably as we are towards the end of 21, this number would have increased and 90% of them use it through mobile devices. In India, it's not different, right? But we have about 825 odd million as of March as per TRA. And if you look at this, what are people doing with their smart devices? There's a umpteen number of social apps that people are using, right? I mean, if any of you have teenage children like I do, uh, the first thing you will notice when they get up is to look at their smartphone. That's the first screen they will see in the day, right? Uh, so, so people are so addicted to their devices. They, they just cannot live without their devices. I mean, for example, we are sending about 188 million emails every minute, right? Which is like about 25 billion emails a day, right? Imagine for the whole year, right? So there's a whole lot of things that people do. Netflix, I mean, that's, that's the rage now, streaming, right? Amazon Prime, Netflix, uh, and so many other streaming apps. You have tweets, you have Tumblr, you have Instagram, you have YouTube. I mean, there's so, so many different kind of social media presence. And so people are actually generating a lot of data. I mean. You go to a restaurant, you can see people taking selfies, selfies of the food, selfies of the group, selfie of the person with whom they are having food. I mean, all, so there's, there's a huge explosion of data. And this kind of graph encapsulates that. So by 2025, we are gonna have about uh, 180 odd petabytes of data, right? And so Eric Schmidt, the, the former chairman of Google was saying that, all the data that we created from the inception of mankind, whenever man came on this earth, until 2020, right? All of that data, we are now creating equivalent of that data every day, right? That's, that's, the, that's the kind of data explosion that is happening. And just to give you an understanding of what do you mean by a better data, right? Oh, 
Yeah. So when you say zeta bytes of data, this is the number of zeros in those bytes. So basically, it's it's one trillion gigabytes of data or a billion terabytes of data. Now you can imagine that's a lot, a lot of data, right? And by 2025, we were, we, the, the estimate is that we will be creating half a zettabyte. That's like 500 exabytes of data every single day of the year, every single day. And the trend is it's going to grow. It's not going to stop. So the point I'm trying to drive here is that there's so much of information. There's so much of data. A lot of this is our personal data. And so we got to secure it. If you don't secure it, it could fall into the wrong hands and potentially we get misused. So how do we secure this data, right? So from a data security perspective, there are three main pillars. We call it the CIA triad. Uh, it's not the US spy agency. C stands for confidentiality, I stands for integrity, and A stands for availability, right? So these are the three core pillars of security. And these three uh, pillars uh, are applicable across my technology landscape. It covers the software I use, it covers the hardware, the communication, the networks on which these things run. It covers the physical facility or the parameters, a perimeter where my uh, hardware is located. And of course, it covers the people that use these systems, right? So that, that, these also constitute what we call as the attack surface, and I'll explain that in a bit. Uh, again, the, the security posture should not drop uh, just because companies you know, merge, spin-offs happen, they kind of morph into new companies. The governance of cyber security cannot drop. Right? That's the important thing to keep in mind. Now, the, all of the three pillars of CA are not the same. Well, ideally they should be the same, but in reality, it's not the same, right? So how does it look in the real world? So in the real world, if I take confidentiality, for example, probably the governments, you know, they, they wanna keep confidentiality is very important to them, the military. So you have things like top secret, secret, you know, for your eyes only, stuff like that. The pharma industry, for example, again, confidentiality is very important. Why is it important? So if I take, I mean, the last two years, we've all been living with COVID, right? Pfizer in 2020 had a revenue of 41 billion US dollars. But in 2021, it expects to get 26 billion just from its COVID vaccine. So just one vaccine is going to give it about 70% of its annual revenue. So you can imagine how important the COVID vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine is to the health of Pfizer, to its profitability, right? The, the world's best-selling drug, uh, Humira, right? It had raked in $20 billion in 2020, right? It's a uh, drug for arthritis, right? So you can imagine if, if the composition of this drug leaks out, there will be competitors who will produce similar products. So it's very really important to keep the confidentiality, the composition, the chemical formula, stuff like that, very important. So confidentiality is great. Let's look at integrity. I mean, the financial services industry is probably the biggest uh, impacted by loss of integrity, right? So I don't want you to see my bank balance. If you can do that, it's not good. But if you can change my bank balance, then it's extremely bad, right? Uh, probably many people will be happy if their balance increases, but nobody will tolerate if their balance decreases, right? Absolutely no. So imagine if companies, you know, they think they are going to be profitable and then it turns out that they are not profitable. So how do you maintain the integrity? I mean, the entire global financial services industry, we have seen the case of Satyam, right? It was a case where the financial integrity, the integrity of data, was just not there and, and the company just collapsed, right? Availability, uh, today with the SaaS companies, with e-commerce companies, uh, all being on the cloud, on the web, uh, availability becomes very important. So if I take example of Amazon, which is the biggest e-commerce e-seller in the world, last year they had a, a total sales of about 386 billion US dollars. 
And if I break that down, it's like something like $12,000 per second, right? So even if Amazon is not there for one hour, uh, if it's not available, their website, they're going to lose like 40 odd million dollars. So Amazon will want to make sure that every customer across the world uh, can access their website without any problem. So they are going to make sure there's no single point of failure. So availability becomes the most important aspect from an Amazon perspective. So in real life, the three different pillars have the three different um, the impact. The importance varies. In addition to that, there is the importance of, of this issue of access control, right? So the AAA, the access control has three parts authentication, authorization, and accountability. What does this mean? First, when I say authentication, you want to be sure, hey, I am Prasad, but am I really Prasad? Is he really Prasad, right? That's what you want to make sure. Once you've done that, I've established that I'm Prasad, then authorization says, hey, what can Prasad do? Can he read this file? Can he modify the file? Can he delete the file? Can he change the directory in which the file is saved? You know, things like this. Third, which is very important, and a lot of times we kind of overlook this. Actually, what did Prasad do? Maybe there was a misconfiguration in your system. I'm only supposed to read the file, but because of your misconfiguration, I downloaded the file. I was able to modify the file. I was able to edit the file. I was, going to, I was able to replace the file with a new file. So what exactly did he do? And this is part of the logging, the auditing, right? And this is where the forensics aspect comes. Did he actually do what he was supposed to do? Did he do more than what he was supposed to do? And how did it impact the security the risk of the organization? The third part uh, of this is the policy, right? So what kind of policy? Policy is a broad statement of intent, right? Typically given by the senior most management. And your policy covers things like, what is your, what should be your password policy, right? Now today, if you notice most e-commerce companies, uh, if you want to do any online, whether it's a bank, e-commerce transaction, etc., you typically have to register yourself. And when you register, one of the aspects of registration is you got to put in a password. And so most companies give you some guidance in terms of what should be your password. How long should it be? Whether it should have a lowercase, uppercase, combination with numbers, special character, what kind of special characters you can use, et cetera, right? So there's typically some guidance on other aspects like patching, uh, validated backup, for example, fair usage, right? At the company, you are supposed to use the internet to do the company work. You, you can't use the internet to see video, for example, right? So things like that. And then you have procedures that actually detail out how the policy is implemented. And then you provide training because if you have a new employee, he can always say, hey, nobody told me this is the company's policy, right? You don't want to end up with an egg on your face. So you want to make sure that every new employee is, is aware of what's the company policy. And typically the best practice is you do this training every once a year. So you kind of refresh people and say, hey, this is our policy. So during the course of the year, if there are any changes to the technology, to the landscape, to the demands of business, et cetera, you're able to fine tune yourself and be ahead of the competition, right? This is probably the most important aspect from a cybersecurity perspective. I think the, the key principle is everyone can do everything that they need to do that they are supposed to do as per their role, but nothing more. This is the key. The moment you allow people to do something more than what they should do, you are having a problem of cybersecurity. And that's where lots of the issues come. So we call this as the principle of least privilege. So basically it says you just need the privilege, the minimum privilege for you to do your job, no, nothing more, nothing more. Now this is all good, yeah, this is all good. But the question is, hey, why should I care? What's in this for me, right? We all have to care because cyber crime is growing. 
and is growing exponentially. Right? Various authorities estimate the cyber crime to be in the region of six trillion dollars in 2021. Various estimates, right? Uh, so General Alexander called this the greatest transfer of wealth in history of mankind. The only problem is this transfer was entirely illegal. It's an illegal transfer, right? So, and ransomware is, is one of the big drivers. Today you have in the dark web, cybercrime as a service, right? You can buy a kit to launch a DDoS attack, right? For as little as about $100. So if you are a small business, typically you go out of business within six months if you are hit by a cyber attack. So this is growing and it's growing exponentially. And Accenture in its latest report estimates the value at risk is more than $5 trillion. I mean, if you put these numbers into perspective, then nobody, not just in India, across the world, there will be nobody who is hunger, who, who doesn't have food to eat, who doesn't have access to drinking water, who doesn't have a place to sleep under, right? So every person on this earth will have access to clean food, drinking water, and a place to live. That's the kind of money we are talking about. The other important aspect is that when you are a victim of cyber crime, you don't recognize this immediately. Typically, it takes you between six to nine months, right? On average, about 200 days to determine, to realize that you are a victim of cyber attack. So which means the attacker has got a clean six to nine months time in which he's exfiltrating your data, he is monitoring you, he's checking what you're doing every day, every second, every minute of the day, right? That, that's what is happening. And even more important, it's, it takes you another average of 70 to 90 days to get rid of this guy, to clean up your system. So from the time you realize to get rid of, getting rid of him, you are looking at potentially a, a time frame of about 10 to 12 months, right? That's a huge number. So a lot of bad things can happen in this time frame, right? So this again, slide captures you. And the last one I want you to draw your attention. Every breach is costing you money. There's a lot of money, right? So about $4 million, right? Multiplied by 75, that's the amount of rupees, right? It's, it's not easy to survive these kind of attacks. And this is a global view. If you look at the top 20 countries outside of the US, US is of course the, the number one target. Uh, India is not far behind and we are kind of number three. <clears throat> and I would like to you know, say that we are number three is simply because a lot of the hackers, you know, they want great value for the work they do. So today with 75 rupees being one US dollar, we are not that attractive. But imagine in say in 10 years, if, if 20 rupees become or 30 rupees become one US dollar, you will see an exponential focus on India from cyber attack perspective. A lot of the cyber attackers will start to look at India and we need to protect ourselves because those uh, before that floodgate opens. So let me give you a couple of uh, real examples to drive home the point, right? <laughs> Now, why is this cyber uh, security so difficult? I mean, we have some of the best engineers in, in the world, right? We have created uh, many companies. Uh, we run the biggest companies, the biggest software companies are all run by Indians. The, the CEO and the chairman of Google, uh, Apple, uh, sorry, uh, Microsoft, uh, Adobe, they're all Indians. So what, what's the problem, right? See, the real problem is, that the equation is very unbalanced. It's lopsided. Attacker, he just needs to find one weakness, one vulnerability. As an engineer, 99% is not enough. You gotta be 100% perfect. You, as, a, as a software engineer, as a security engineer, you gotta do your job 100% perfect and more than 100%. Whereas an attacker, I just need one weakness, one vulnerability. It, and it doesn't matter, it could be any vulnerability, right? And I can bring the company down, I can steal data. So, so you can imagine the equation is very much lopsided. And this is what makes the job a lot, lot difficult. 
right? Last year, we have created 110 billion lines of new software code, right? Uh, there are about 1.9 billion websites and we, we will never be able to test our software 100%. That's just not possible. If I have to do 100% testing of my software, I will never be able to release my software. And it probably will take me several centuries, right? In terms of time, right? Even using the most sophisticated, most powerful computer systems. So most companies only test the software for the most common things that they think will happen. And that's where the cyber malicious hackers come into play. They're very persistent. They have a lot of time. They have a lot of patience. They check a lot of things that you typically would not have checked. And that's the real issue, right? So let me put a poll here and say, hey, which of these do you think has more software? Any guess? Most people tend to say it's either the jet fighter or the Boeing Dreamliner. And why are we right? Today, the cars have more software, right? Especially if you look at the higher end cars, they have 100 million lines of code, right? And so this is an example of a cyber physical system that can horribly go wrong in this video. And I've shared the link, you can watch this video in your free time. So basically this was a Chrysler Jeep. This was in the year 2015. And the guys here that shown here, Charlie uh, Miller and Chris Wallace, these were the two guys. And the guy here in the car is their very good friend. So basically what they did is in 2014 and 13, they went to all the major car manufacturers, the top 10 car manufacturers in the world and told them, hey, your car can be hacked. And these guys didn't believe them. They kind of you know, laughed at them. And so what these guys did is they took this Chrysler Jeep and they asked their friend to drive on the road. And they told him, hey, we, some funny things may happen, but will not put your life in danger. So don't worry. Okay, and being good friend, he went out on the road and a couple of minutes later, a lot of funny things started to happen. I mean, he's kind of pressing the accelerator, but the car is not going beyond 10 miles an hour, right? And behind him, there's a whole line of cars and trucks and vehicles backing up. And then suddenly all of the, uh, you know, out of the blue, the car just zooms and he's not even touching the accelerator. The car just zooms and he's kind of overspeeding, right? Now, while all of this is happening, they're talking to him on the mobile phone, right? And so this guy get, kind of gets scary because uh, the, 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 the solution on the windscreen comes, but the windscreen wiper is not working, right? He, the, the, he's listening to some music and suddenly the radio comes on, the channels keep changing, and then the air conditioner kind of wakes up and it's freezing, it's blowing full blast. He's finally, they come to a situation where he's unable to get out of the car. They kind of bring the car to a ditch, but he's unable to get out. He's locked in his own car. And all of this is not fantasy. This is real. Please watch the video. So this is a great example. I mean, today, most people associate a, a car as an automobile, right? In today's context, a car is probably a computer on wheels, right? And so 50% of the cost of a car typically is close to the software and the sensors that the car is built with. So this is a great example of cybersecurity. This is another example. This is probably the example of the first cyber war, right? So this picture is the president, shows the president of uh, Iran, uh, Mohammad Ahmadjudeev who is pictured in a nuclear facility in Iran, right? This is the facility where Iran was enriching uh, uranium, potentially to make nuclear weapons. And obviously a number of countries uh, did not want Iran to acquire nuclear weapons. Uh, principally, uh, US and Israel were absolutely opposed to this. And so what they did and really what happened, I mean, of course, no, nobody has taken any formal credit for it. Uh, there, there's nobody says who has done it, but the guess and a lot of indicators 
uh, telltale signs is that it was done jointly by US and Iran. And basically what they did, they created a, a piece of software code. Uh, it was called Stuxnet. And the beauty of this is this facility was air gapped. That means it was not connected to the internet. So there was no way they could infect it, right? But what they did was they found out that there was a company in Belarus which used to bring in USB drives, software in USB drives to this facility and then fix the software bugs. So these guys wrote a software. This software would only infect computers that ran Windows XP. And that computer had to be connected to a SCADA system, which was had to be of Siemens May and had to be a particular model number. Right. Only if it met all of these conditions, then it would get infect the system. So in three months time, the worm found its way to the computers in Belarus. From Belarus, it reached here. And so in the engineers in their in their control room in the SCADA center, you know, on and off, they would hear kind of loud sound, but not realize what's happening. I mean, they would walk around, nothing seems out of the place. Everything seems normal, but once in a while they would hear loud sounds. And basically they realized later that the centrifuge tubes, the ones that spin at a high speed to separate the heavy uranium to, to provide the, uh, to produce the missile, uh, the fissile missile material, those tubes were cracking because the controllers were running them, were spinning them beyond their rated capacity. And so uh, it turned out that uh, Iran lost about 30, 35% of their capacity, right, of their capacity to produce an engine. And th this was accepted. I mean, the president told his parliament that Iran has suffered a, a technical setback, right? The same day, the Israeli prime minister uh, told his parliament that it appears Iran has faced some technical issues. And President Obama was told by his uh, national security advisor that it appears that Iran has faced uh, some technical issues. So it may take them a while to figure out what's the problem, right? This is probably the first known uh, instance of a cyber war, right? Target is the second largest retail company in the US, more than a thousand plus stores. And uh, it, it has a cult following in the US, right? In, in 2015, 2014 end, from Thanksgiving, I mean, which is around this time of the year, until Christmas, uh, roughly in those 40 days is typically when, uh, I mean, in those 35, 40 days is when 40% of all US retail sales happen. So it's a way, as a retailer, it's, it's extremely important for you to be active during that time. And what hackers did is there was a company that uh, provided air conditioning to target. The stores were, uh, you know, service, the air conditioning service provider. He used a antivirus software, which he did not buy. He used a free version. The free version was meant for individual users, not for companies, but he used that for his company. And so it had very limited, it provided very limited protection. So a phishing email was sent to one of the employees who unknowingly clicked the email and therefore the hackers could get his credentials. They logged in as this person and introduced malware into Target's network and basically skimmed off 40 million credit card users and 70 million uh, customers. So a whole lot of bad things happened. So several billion dollars were lost. The worst thing was the entire board of Target had to leave they were forced to resign. Again, this is the same thing happened with the Central Bank of Bangladesh, uh, where, you know, they, they lost about, they, they lost about a billion dollars, but some of it could be recovered back. The rest, about 81 million, they, even today there is no trace. They just don't know where this money went. And you had to understand the hacker I mean, if you go back and look in the calendar, 4th of February, 2016 is a Friday, and which is a holiday in a Muslim country. 
And the director who looks at the remittances that came in and out of the central bank, he came in mid afternoon after his daily prayers to, and he found that there was no printout. The bank had a procedure where every foreign exchange transaction, incoming or outgoing, would get printed. And that day, there was no print. I mean, there was no output. So the guy, you know, they were pretty perplexed. Hey, what's wrong? How can it be? I mean, a country with 120, 150 million people, there's no exchange, no transaction. So they, they kind of uh, dig around and they realized the printer is not working. By the time they got the printer to work, it was the weekend in New York, right? And so it, they had to wait till New York got back to work. And then they realized what happened, right? So th this is, it's an unsolved mystery even today, right? Uh, Equifax, this is another one. Marriott, I mean, this is a great example where Marriott had a fantastic ID system, but Marriott purchased Starwood, which was a big rival. And Starwood was already, their loyalty program was already compromised. And it's believed it was the Chinese government, right? Chinese people, uh, advanced persistent threat, you know, APD kind of people backed by the Chinese government. And the big, big attraction was that Marriott happened to be the hotel of choice for US federal government employees. So this was a nice way for people to get hold of details about US government employees. Which otherwise would remain would have remained confidential. This is something that a lot of you know. Colonial pipeline. It was in the news for a lot of wrong reasons. Uh, airlines had to cancel flights. Uh, petrol prices rose up by three times simply because uh, an example of of uh, ICS industrial control systems. The pipeline could not pipe pump oil from Houston all the way to New York. Uh, cities ran out of fuel and caused a lot of problems. The, 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 so that, that's, that's some examples. Uh, this is again using internet, you know, the Mirai botnet, they brought down the entire internet. Uh, companies could not, people could not access their websites. So lots of bad things. And this is again, very important. This is from a medical perspective. For example, uh, in India, you know, across the world, people have pacemaker in their hearts to regulate their heartbeat. Uh, people have uh, insulin pumps, especially not so common in India, but outside people have insulin pumps to regulate the blood sugar and, and you can hack these devices. In fact, the story is that uh, before uh, uh, USA attacked uh, Afghanistan after 9-11, uh, uh, Dick Cheney, who was then the vice president of US, had a heart maker and he kind of replaced it with a more hardened heart maker so that people outside, people near him could not wirelessly hack his uh, pacemaker. Yeah. So this kind of give you a few examples. Uh, I want to bring in, so what's the common thing, right? So the most common thing in all of this is the human factor, right? And for a human factor, the first thing is our credential, right? So lots of times people use, uh, you know, we all say use strong passwords, don't reuse passwords. Uh, that's all good to say. I mean, an average person like me, we probably have like say maybe 50, 70 different accounts. How will I remember 50, 70 different passwords? I mean, it's, it's, it's just not realistic, right? So people tend to reuse passwords. They tend to keep smaller size passwords. But the problem is that you can become a victim. And so, for example, just to give you a simple example, if you can go here. Just give me one second. Can I get my screen? Yeah. So here, if I just type, right? Uh, I just use simple. Now here it tells you how uh, easy it is uh, to get hacked. Okay, so I have three scenarios. I have an online, like uh, using tools like Jack the Ripper or something like that. Uh, and then I have a more cloud-based, more powerful system. So it's not even a second, right? I add some numbers, one, two, three, right? And it's now 0.8 seconds. 
And so you see that it's going to become a problem, right? And this is just seven characters. Now, even if I add a symbol, it, it increases, it makes it a little more, but it's like one hour, right? It's it's nothing, right? But so let me say if I if I kind of make this like a password, right? I like working at this is a password. It's it's easy for me to remember, but it's not easy to get hacked. Right? Certainly not in my lifetime. So this is just a simple example. I'm not advocating that you have to do it like this, but it gives you an idea that, hey, passwords are important. You got to have unique passwords. The longer the password, it's harder to break, right? Use a combination of passwords which have uppercase, lowercase, numbers, symbols. That's the first thing that you can do to, to you know, remove your cyber ignorance. The second, of course, is in terms of malware, right? Have a good antivirus software. For example, in, in 2017, when uh, this uh, malware attack happened, right? This is how a screenshot of, of a malware would come. And you got to pay in Bitcoin because the hacker wants to be anonymous. Now, when this happened, actually, this infected uh, Windows running XP. And to be fair, when Microsoft had already said XP is end of life and they will not support it anymore. But as a true good citizen, they, they kind of came up with a patch. And when the patch was released in March of 2017, you can see that there were a good number of downloads. People applied the patch. And then after a while, it kind of tapered down. This is when the WannaCry ransom hit us. And from here, people who had not patched became victims. And, and these were not just small individuals. These included lots of big universities, organizations, etc. right? So ransomware is today a major problem. We, we got to protect ourselves from it. Social engineering is another issue, right? Phishing, for example. What is phishing? Phishing typically is you try to target somebody to click on something. Maybe you send an email uh, to them. It looks like your boss has sent you the email. Right, you you so you, you you don't pay a lot of attention, but you click on it, and then you've downloaded a malware. Bad things happen to you. You you phishing can be detected. You had to pay attention. Okay. Uh, do I have time? Um, how is it going on time? Uh, yes, sir. You can take ten fifteen minutes more, sir. Okay. Okay. So I just want to play a short video. This kind of drives home very well what I'm talking about. DEF CON is the biggest hacker convention of the year. It's a place where thousands of hackers come to hear talks to demonstrate their newest hacks. It's actually a place that's so dangerous to, to be on the internet that they tell you to turn off the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth on your phone. And they tell you not to use the ATMs too because those could be hacked as well. This is the DEF CON ballroom. This is sort of the main room where things are happening. It's pretty wild. I think this is car hacking village. This car is locked. Can you get me in? I'll unlock it for you. Should be good. <laughs> hacking is no longer like this fringe activity. And if you are at DEF CON, there's a good chance that you're here because you want to learn what could happen to you or your company. Anyone here first time in the CCPF? Holy crap. I invited Chris to hack me. Uh, with his team, um, but they're going to hack me using social engineering, which is essentially hacking without any code. They just use a phone and an internet connection. We help people with human security issues by testing vulnerabilities for, um, for like a network test, but it's for the people network. We test those vulnerabilities, see where the holes are, and then help people learn so they can patch them. Can we try some of this? Can we try some? Yeah, see I mean, if it works. We, we probably could um, have our star visher here make some phone calls as <laughs> Let's do it. Is. Sure. You want to do a sample vishing call? What's vishing? Vishing is voice solicitation. And basically, um, what you do is you use the phone to extract information or data points that can be used in a later attack. Let's do it. Okay. You, who are you going to call? Maybe I'll call your cell phone provider okay. and see if I can get them to give me your email address. I, I bet they're good. I bet they have my back. <laughs> but yeah, go go for it. I'm going to spoof from your number, so it's going to look like it's calling from you. OK. Hi. I'm actually, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me OK? I, my baby, 
I'm sorry. <laughs> my <laughs> my husband's like, we're about to apply for a loan and we just had a baby and he's like, get this done by today. So I'm so sorry. I can't I, um, call you back. <laughs> I'm trying to log into our account for uses information and I can't remember what email address we use to log the account. The baby's crying and um, can, can you help me? Awesome. In just 30 seconds, Jessica gets my personal email address. Um, now, if I needed to um, add our older daughter on our account so she could call in and make changes, how would I need to go about doing that? You would have to send me a secure pin through a text message. Yeah, well, the thing is, I don't think I'll be able to receive a text message if I'm on the phone. Oh, I'm not on there either. I, so I thought when we got married, um, he added me to the account. Okay, my Jessica name. uses my girlfriend's name and a fake social security number 5127. to set up her own personal access to my account. Wait, I'm sorry. So there's no password on my account right now? Can I set that up? She I even gets the support person to change my password. Thank you so much for your help today. So she just no, basically no, blocked me out of my own account. I'll get her fed after this. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Holy shit. So they, they, just gave, they just gave you access to my entire cell phone account. You're going to have to go on and change your password now because it's Jess, my name. And all it took was a crying baby and a phone call. Yes. I really thought that my cell phone company would protect me. I mean, like, this is the most basic stuff, and, and they're not doing it. And if they're not... DEF CON is the biggest hacker convention of the year. It's a place where thousands of hackers come. All it took was a crap thought that my cell phone company, and they're not doing it. And if they're not doing it, you know all these other businesses aren't doing it either. Anyone with a phone and an internet section can do social engineering. But I was curious. What can a hacker with serious coding skills do? Well, DEF CON is the world's biggest hacking convention. It's hacking everything, hacking uh, social, hacking hardware, hacking software, hacking various systems. I asked Dan Tentler, a well-known security researcher, to turn all of his firepower on me. I did get into quite a number of things that I found. So what were the first things you did? How did you start hacking me? Uh, I quickly found your Squarespace blog and had an idea. Uh, basically what I did was created a bogus Squarespace site and sent an email to you, um, a fish asking you to go to this website, run this certificate install. And I did it because I'm an idiot. So once you ran that, uh, it gave me access to your computer and I created several fake pop-ups that looked like system pop-ups uh, that would ask you for your credentials. You didn't even have to have my passwords. No, oh, you gave them to me. I gave them to you. Yeah. So I, I stole your 1Password keychain. That's and 1Password is where I store all my other passwords. So effectively by- And your social security number and your AMAX stuff and all your stock trading and bank information. I can send email to everyone in this room as you. I am you right now, if I wanted to be. If my evilness is working correctly, it should actually be taking pictures of your desktop and pictures through your webcam every two minutes. And I have been watching you for about two days now. In oh coffee shops at your mom's house on a plane. Here's your editing stuff. There's your. Oh my god! So this is literally every two minutes through my webcam. Yeah, through this guy. How badly could you have messed up my life? I could have made you homeless. I could have made you homeless and penniless. How? Like, how? How would you make me homeless? Like I have control of your your digital life in its entirety. I have all your credentials. I have all your access to all your financial information, all your work information, all your personal information. I can pay people with your bank account or your Amex account. I am you. I can fully impersonate. Like the only thing I couldn't doctor would be like your fingerprints. <laughs> this is like as bad as it It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's bad. So it turns out that Dan Tentler is very good at his job. I mean, he hacked the hell out of me. He got everything. I mean, frankly, I want to take my computer and throw it into the deepest part of the ocean. And I want to become a hermit. And I want to never touch a piece of technology again. Because... Holy shit, that was that was everything. That was the keys to my entire life. And he just he just pulled them out of his pocket. Okay. So let's uh, move on. Yeah. Are you able to see my slides again? Yes, sir. 
Okay, great. So, so that gave you an idea about phishing. The other important thing is now people are beginning to realize that there's this problem. And so there's a huge uh, gap in terms of job opportunities, right? Uh, so the, 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 we are not getting enough people. And so globally, there's, there's like 3 million plus vacancies. Uh, the US uh, Department of Labor, which tracks about 800 different jobs, says information security analysis is one of the fastest growing ones, right? So th that's the big issue, right? And so I kind of want to summarize and say, hey, as, as individuals, how can we get rid of our ignorance of cybersecurity and what can we do to protect ourselves? And so some of the things that we can do are things like using strong passwords, keeping your software up to date, getting trained, getting yourself educated, making yourself aware, being aware of various social engineering hacks, in particular, uh, you know, phishing emails, keeping your backup. And I use the word validated backup because it means that you have tested your backup and you can restore your system from your backup. I mean, this is a great example. So you're a victim of ransomware and you don't want to pay the ransomware. You can reformat your computer and in restore all your data from your validated backup, right? But if you don't have the backup or you have the backup, but you can't restore, then bad luck, right? So these are things that we can do as individuals. So I would like to conclude by saying cybersecurity is everyone's responsibility. We all have to do our part. It's better to be cyber safe than cyber ignorant. Thank you very much.